So the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, it's uh, only verses 41 and 42. I'll read right through 43 just to finalize it. So this is the word of the Lord. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. <clears throat> father God, we pray now that um, you would speak into our hearts, Lord, on this difficult, uncomfortable topic. Um, father, we want to <clears throat> hear from you. We want to know you better. We want to understand our faith more. May you bless us with that gift today. <clears throat> so open our ears, Lord, and speak, for your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so this is a, the third in our topical series that we've had since we left Acts. And there's probably maybe two, maybe three more, uh, but definitely two more um, topics before we start the next book. Um, they say a preacher should make comfortable the uncomfortable and make uncomfortable the comfortable. I think our church generally is pretty comfortable for the most part, which is concerning. So this series that we're in is called the uncomfortable topics. We've done the blood, we've done election. You could also say maybe predestination, election. Um, what else do we call it? I don't remember what else we called it, but uh, that was last week. And today we're gonna to be talking about another uncomfortable sermon. Uh, this sermon topic is uncomfortable for the preacher to preach. <clears throat> um, not so much so to a bunch of believers, but certainly to maybe those who are not believers, and maybe to believers because we all know people who are not believers, and we love people like that. Our sermon today is on hell. Hell. So you're going to get a good fire and brimstone sermon. Um, however, it's also said that a sermon on hell should be preached with tears in the eyes of the preacher. Um, a preacher should not preach on hell unless he has tears in his eyes. Now that's a, a, a nice thing to say. Um, but just because there's no tears in my eyes now doesn't mean that this is not a weighty, very weighty subject. Something that we agonize over sometimes. And it, uh, we, sometimes we do weep over this topic. The last time I preached on hell was in March of 2009. Uh, for those few of you who were here back then, uh, or actually a good amount of us, you probably don't remember, because I didn't remember until I looked it up. I did four sermons on hell uh, in March, leading up to that Easter in 2009. Um, so this is sort of a compilation of that with some extra seasoning of, from my experience and my you know, progress in thinking about it over the years. Uh, this is sort of a compilation of those four sermons. I'm going to be talking about five um, talking points, five qualities or characteristics of hell today. <clears throat> you know, I hear a lot of you say sometimes, oh, you never hear a pastor preach about hell. You never hear a pastor preach about, you know, this or that or, or sin or whatever. But in defense of pastors, there's a lot to pick 
and choose to preach from the Bible. You just can't hit all the topics. <clears throat> um, but over the course of time, <clears throat> over the months and years, you should hit a lot of them, or the preacher should hit a lot of them. So today you can put a little note in your Bible or your notebook and say, um, Sermon on Hell. <laughs> so you can go back there in a few months or years and say, oh, he did give a sermon on hell. <clears throat> but I don't give this lightly either. I mean, that's kind of fun things to say, but um, uh, this is, a, again, a very weighty topic. And it should bring a, some sense of uncomfortableness to some of us. So it's really amazing how we've become, we as a people in America especially, have become quite comfortable with the idea of hell. Over the generations, we've kind of worked it and, you know, we've read about it, we've seen movies of it. Um, most of the movies, if I'm not mistaken, that you might have seen on hell, oftentimes the people get out of it. It's either made a joke of, or people go there and then they do something right and they're brought out of hell and the end of the movie is they get to heaven and that foggy gold pearly gate and gold, you know, and pearl and white and bright lights and everything. <clears throat> it's, 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 it's Hollywood, that's the movies. But we've become very comfortable with hell and it's become palatable and not offensive to us anymore. We say terms like, and I say this reverently just to make the point, we say, oh, the hell with that, or uh, go to hell, or um, um, that it's cold as hell. I never understood that one, right? It's cold as hell today. But we, we use a term, and it, after you use it enough, it becomes just part of the language, and we kind of forget about the actual place that it, we speak of. And we need sermons like this, and pastors need to study it to remind us that we may remind you of the biblical hell. Now, out of our desire to make sense of it in our minds, because it is a very difficult thing to accept, uh, over the course of history of the church, some have made, have found ways to make it a little bit more palatable, a little bit more, a little bit easier to accept. Uh, I think John mentioned last week um, that there came up the idea of annihilation. Um, once you die, you may spend some time paying for the price of your sins, but then you're wiped out. Hell will burn you up and you'll be done. <clears throat> you'll be back to nothing. You'll be annihilated. And then, especially the Catholic Church came up with things like purgatory, right? Purgatory is a little bit more palatable than hell. People, when they die, they go there. It's kind of a holding place for the final, until the final judgment. And, you know, in the Middle Ages and maybe a little bit later on, uh, again, the Catholic Church, you could buy people out of hell. You could donate to the, to the, the church uh, enough money and you can purchase their souls out of hell. Um, but it's purgatory and there's always that chance that they'll be, you know, we can handle our loved ones going to purgatory because there's a possibility that they'll come out. But it's awfully hard to, to handle them being in eternal torment in in a, a burning lake of fire. But hell should not find any, um, any way to be more palatable in our mouth, in our, in our, in our theology. <clears throat> There's no biblical concept or idea more grim or terror invoking than the idea of hell. Um, I think before 2009, I only 
had maybe one other sermon on it. So um, in 18 years, this is the fifth time I've preached on it. Um, so it's going to be, this is again, a kind of a compilation, an overview of it, but we're going to hit some important points. And it's going to end up well. So it may be uncomfortable, may squirm in our seats a little bit, um, but at the end, we're, it's going to end up well. Um, <clears throat> I think it was Charles Spurgeon said, <clears throat> and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, greatly paraphrase this because I don't have the quote in front of me, but he says, if people go to hell, let them go leaping over our, our praying bodies, leaping over our bodies. And I, I picture our, our Monday night prayer meeting here when we pray for, you know, some of your people uh, who we are not saved. I mean, we bring names to, to the prayer meeting, usually from our own family or friends or contacts or whatever. And we pray for their salvation. <clears throat> And if they're going to go to hell, they have to climb over our praying bodies as we're praying on our knees. <clears throat> and Spurgeon said, if they perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, begging them to stay, that they may be saved. This world... You've heard me say this before. This world is the closest thing that a believer will ever get to hell. As bad as this world gets, that's the closest we can get to hell. Because if you're a believer and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved. You will be saved. And on the same note, this world, sadly, is the closest that a non-believer will ever get to heaven. This is the best it will get for a non-believer. That's not saying much. I mean, there's a lot of good things about this, this life, this world. It's beautiful. It can, it can get a lot of joy and happiness up from it. But this isn't heaven. But this is the closest a non-believer will ever get to heaven. So we're going to look at five. This is the first. We're going to look at the reality of hell. Uh, first, and I'll go down, I'm, I won't tell you what they all are, but I'll go down. It'll take just a couple minutes for each one. <clears throat> the name, hell is called by different names in the Bible. And <clears throat> it's, it's interesting that the Old Testament doesn't really have any <clears throat> clear teaching on hell itself. There's ideas of it. There's references to the grave, Sheol, Hades. Hades can go either way. It can be either hell or the grave or the final resting place, you might say. But there's no real mention of a burning lake of fire or demons being chained to the walls in deep darkness. That, those are New Test, that's a New Testament language there. But there were some things in the Old Testament which would have portrayed a type of hell to the people back then, two, 3,000 years prior to Jesus. And those, the language might be something like um, uh, in Jeremiah, it says, they became a waste and a desolation. I will make them a heap of ruins. And God would like uh, judge people by not allowing anything to grow, that they would not be prosperous, that they would not have their own land, things like that. It's like that's the, the worst it got for them. And that was bad. I mean, slavery in Egypt for 400 years. I mean, they had no freedom, no power, no hope of escape. That was kind of a, an image of hell, not as horrifying as we have today in the New Testament. But it's like that would uh, 
bring chills down their spine to say we're going back into the bondage of slavery where we'll have no hope of deliverance. It's kind of a, a, a subtle foreshadow of hell. Gehenna is the term used often in the New Testament to, to refer to hell. It comes from the, the words Gehinnom, Gehinnom, which means Valley of Hinnom. And I'm sure you know this, you've heard this, the term to use metaphorically to talk about the, um, the valley outside the southern gate of Jerusalem, where it's known for two things. One, later on, it was known for a trash heap. They would put all the trash from the city, hundreds of thousands of people, they generate trash just like we do. They put it outside the south gate, they burn it. It'd be a perpetual fire, a fire going always because there's a constant supply of waste and trash and, and things that they're getting rid of and dead bodies perhaps. They'd throw everything into this pit and it was an ongoing burning cesspool of, of trash. But also you'll read through the Old Testament of the god Moloch, Mil Mil Milcom, Moloch, and known by other names. And people would go to this valley outside the gate of Jerusalem and sacrifice their children to this god. I have a very detailed description of how that would go. I'm not going to tell that because this is an uncomfortable topic series, but I'm not going to just give you nightmares tonight because it's really unimaginable how they um, sacrifice their infants to this God. So the Bible has several different names and that's what hell is, is um, that's how the Bible, the, the Lord through the writers conveys the idea of what hell is by referencing that, that pit, that valley outside of Jerusalem where it's a constant fire. And then we ask what hell is like, the reality of it, what, what it's like. I'm gonna give you some descriptions that are found in the scripture, um, maybe four or five. It's described as a bottomless pit or the pit of the abyss. It's a place that God created for those who are unable or not allowed to live in his presence. Revelation 9.2 <clears throat> talks about the bottomless pit. I don't know if I, I'm not going to turn to all these references, but um, I'll, I'll read this one. Um, 9, 1 and 2, Revelation 9, 1 and 2. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Can you imagine being cast into a deep, dark, fiery, smoky pit? And you just sink deeper and deeper and deeper. Demons and evil spirits in chambers in the side, chained to the sides, grabbing for you, spitting fire on you. And you keep hoping you hit bottom, but it seems like it keeps going. It says a bottomless pit. And all the things you love get further and further away. And God gets further and further away. Hope gets further and further away. And it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Another description of hell in the scripture is that of an everlasting fire. Again, that, that image of the trash heap outside the city. Matthew 13, 40 and 42, just the part of that parable, uh, talks about the tares and the wheat. 
It says, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if we think about physically burning, it would be unimaginably unpleasant for a period of time, but then we die, right? But that's not what the Bible says. It's an unquenchable fire, an everlasting fire. People gnashing their teeth. The fire of hell is a special kind of fire. It burns, but it doesn't consume things. It doesn't consume the body. It has all the characteristics of fire, but things don't get burned up. It just burns. We have a wood stove at the house, at the parsonage, and um, it creates a nice atmosphere. Fire contained is fine, but you don't want it to get out of control. But when I load the fire, sometimes if I don't wear my big asbestos gloves, I'll put a log in and it's like 500, 600 degrees in there, right? That's what the thermometer on the top says. It's probably a lot hotter inside the box. And I'll put the log in and I, sometimes the hairs on my hand, and I'm a hairy guy, the hairs on my hand will singe. And you might even smell it. If I have my little Dr. Denton pajamas on. <laughs> um, no, not really. But if I have like sweatshirt or something on, you may feel, smell the heat of, of the, the fabric. That's uncomfortable. Can you imagine that for eternity? And more than that, you're constantly and fully engulfed. I mean, I, I just can't conceive what that would be like. The sun will eventually burn out. The stars will eventually become cold and dead. But the fires of hell will still burn. And they'll never burn out. Revelation 20.10 says, The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I'm not trying to strike fear in you. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'd like to soften it up, but I can't get around these scriptures. You might say it's, it's allegory. You might say it's, it's just imagery. Uh, that's something you have to decide. But the scripture is consistent in telling us the, the, the nature of hell. It says in 1 John 1, 5, it is hell is the outer darkness. Well, 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So Christ is light, God is light. The removal of that is pure darkness, outer darkness. Can you imagine being so dark that it can be felt? I think um, Exodus 10.21 says it. said, <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So there is a darkness so dark that can be almost felt. And I think we probably have all experienced that. I've told the story a number of times. Uh, walking home from here to the house, um, like on a winter night when it gets dark early, and it is so dark. There's not any light. There's no street lights on the first part of our street. Um, I'm in the woods going uh, through that way towards the house. It is so dark. Um, now imagine being that dark and then having a cover put over you to make it even more dark. I mean, it, it's like, no light. I don't know, maybe this fire of hell doesn't even have light to it. Maybe the characteristics of that fire, although it has a lot of the 
characteristics. It doesn't burn things up. But it's outer darkness. Hell is outer darkness. It's everlasting punishment. It's endless suffering. Endless in that hell is forever and has no end. Suffering in that condition is constant torment. <clears throat> and you say, well, how, how can that be? How can it be constant? <clears throat> I had a friend of mine many years ago where we used to work, we, we had conversations and he said, Steve, don't you think it eventually after hundreds, thousands of years get used to the torment? I mean, it becomes normal, right? It just becomes natural, part of life. You know you're not going to die. You know you're not going to... That's a scary position to take, isn't it? It's like, if you can make sense of it that way, if that helps you to deal with it, but it's, it's not... <clears throat> I don't want to go there. And I listened to John MacArthur this week talking about uh, giving his sermon on hell. And he said, he said, people in hell don't stop sinning. It's not like sinners who... Re reject Jesus Christ, go to hell, and then they're just normal people. They continue to sin. <clears throat> there's another study I did. I don't remember what it was, but there's reference or there's um, support for it in Scripture. Is that those who go to hell, <clears throat> and we'll look at it in Luke uh, 16 with Lazarus and the rich man. You remember that story? <clears throat> um, we'll look at this in a moment there. But when people go to hell, they don't like realize they did something wrong and repent. They hate God all the more because they're there and figure all goodness, all reasonableness, all morality is removed. And now there's nothing but evilness. So people say, well, how can God punish somebody for eternity? Well, it's because they keep sinning. And he keeps adding punishment. John MacArthur says the, the punishment never catches up to the sin. So he punishes all the sin up to that point. Then they sin again. So he's punishing them again. So it's a perpetual punishment for their sin. And it goes on for eternity. Scary, scary stuff. So there's one thing that hell isn't. Hell isn't. Well, there's more than one thing, but hell is not sufficient to save us, to save people. This sermon, a sermon just on hell, may start the process of you intellectually, emotionally, whatever, thinking, I don't want to go there. I got to evaluate myself to make sure I don't go there. Maybe I am a sinner. I have to find, you can get to the process of salvation, but I can't scare the hell out of you. And I say that not as a cliche, but in literal words, I cannot scare the hell out of you. That has to be done by between you and the Lord. <clears throat> I, I think I made my point with the... Um, well, I'll read the, the Luke passage anyway, Luke 16, um, part of it. You remember the story where Lazarus was a, um, a, a, a poor beggar uh, laid at the, the gate of a rich man. Uh, the rich man, we don't have his name, but Lazarus was there and he would just get the crumbs from the rich man's table and be fed with that. And he had sores all over his body and the dogs would come and lick his sores. And eventually the Lazarus died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, which is a reference to heaven, uh, paradise. Um, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, or hell, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Now let, listen to what he said. He said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. And then he said, I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. And Abraham said, um, 
they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if somebody goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham says, no, they won't. If they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to repent of somebody. But there is never any sense of repentance from this um, rich man who died. <clears throat> there was never, he said, have mercy on me. But yeah, it's like, have mercy on me. Get me out of here. But he did never any repentance. And the idea was that he was in anguish. Uh, the words are right there. He was in anguish. He was um, um, thirsty, hot, uh, in anguish in this flame. And, um, and there was no sense of, of, of uh, repentance. So that's an example, a little example. One example of those who go to hell don't realize they, they want to rescue the others, but they, they, they have no sense of, of um, uh, or they can't or they don't repent and seek deliverance even after they're gone. <clears throat> so uh, the, the rest of them aren't going to go that long. Um, the reason for hell. Um, You have to know the character of God to appreciate the reason for hell. <clears throat> I'm going to read some characteristics, some attributes of God. Just go right, I'm going to go right down. There's 13 I have here. There's more, but I'll read the 13. God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. God is faithful. God is love. God is all-powerful or omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient ever-present or omnipresent. God is long-suffering. He is infinite. He is sovereign. He is truth. He is wisdom. He's all these things all the time. <clears throat> and he must act according to that. <clears throat> he is perfectly holy. There's no, never any sin, never any unjust thought or action that comes from him. <clears throat> All these attributes together help us to understand that God has to execute wrath against things that are a violation of those things. So people say, well, there's, John talked about it last week, there's that universalism idea that, well, eventually everyone will get to heaven. And that's, that's a thought that people have. Um, but it's like if you were perfect, if you were in a perfect heaven, all perfection, all light, all perfect love, um, no evil, no sense of evil whatsoever, it doesn't even come into people's minds. And then I come in there, right? with my sinful nature, right? I, I'll spoil the whole thing. It will no longer be perfect because there's one thing that's not perfect and that will spoil everything. People talk about extraterrestrials and I'll just throw this in as a freebie. It's like, oh, you think there's people on other planets, other worlds? I say, if there are, maybe they didn't sin and maybe they have a force field around themselves so that we don't get to them because we'll corrupt them. Now, even if they don't sin, they still need a savior because all creation was corrupted in the garden and all creation needs redemption. But apart from that, you know, I said, it doesn't bother me if there's other life somewhere else, but um, maybe they didn't sin. Maybe they're living that utopia, that perfect uh, existence. Um, that's not theological, that's not part of the sermon, that's just the thought. But if, if they let us in, we'd bring all our sinfulness, all that sinful blood into their perfect creation, and it would soil the whole thing, it would spoil the whole thing. So God cannot let any of that into his heaven. So now you have perfection, and you have everything else. <clears throat> and we're going to get to this at the end. So the reason for hell is to have a place to throw everything that is not going to be in heaven. Um, 
We're going to talk now, in a minute, the residents of hell, those who will take up residence, those who will be in hell. So the reason and the residence kind of go together. I'm, I'm making them go together because as we look at those who will be in hell, we'll see the reason that there is a hell. So we'll look at the residents. Who will end up there? Satan, and, and this is straight from the scriptures, Satan and his fallen angels. Satan is not in the burning lake now. He's in sort of what the Bible calls a prison. But he's destined for hell. He was cast out of heaven to earth. Um, it says in Genesis 3 where Satan, the serpent, deceived Adam and Eve. He was in the Garden of Eden. So he was there. Job 1.7, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, going to and fro from the earth and walking up and down, up, uh, up, up and down on it. So he's not confined to the lake of fire yet. He's confined somehow, but has freedom over this world in some sense. Matthew 4, Satan meets Jesus in the wilderness to tempt him. Luke 22, 31, 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that you, your faith may not fail. Um, and there's other references. Uh, look, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He can't do that from hell. I mean, from the permanent place of eternal torture. So he's kind of not confined there yet, but it's made for him and his fallen angels. The angels who um, had relations with the women in Genesis 6, uh, they are in this uh, place leading to hell. The angels who do not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And those who die without believing in Christ will be in hell. That's more difficult because we know, we don't know we don't know, we don't see angels, fallen angels, we don't see Satan on a daily basis, but we see some people who reject Christ, don't we? And the Bible is clear. Uh, I'll read some scriptures here. I'll go through them quickly. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. Forget their God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. Um, those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So in general, anyone who, didn't, who dies without repenting of their sin and without receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will end up in this unimaginable hell. Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Back a couple verses, Revelation 14, 9 and 10, and another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead or, or on his hand, he, will, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. That is quite the language. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Again in Revelation 21, 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And before that, 2015, Revelation 2015, and whoever was not found written, and who, whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So 
So in summary, the ones who will be in hell are Satan, fallen angels, demons. Now I'm going to qualify this in a minute. Cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, unrighteous, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. You want to be with them? Anyone? That's going to be a nasty group down there. And I, I went through these, and if you take the Sermon on the Mount approach, I'm guilty of ten of those things. I didn't murder, but I've hated people. Jesus says if you hate your brother, it's like murdering them. I've never committed adultery, but I've looked at women with thoughts. I've never been convicted of robbery, but I've coveted things. I've stolen, not stolen, well, lifted things. Maybe they weren't mine. I've been greedy. I've gotten drunk. Not a drunkard, but I've gotten drunk in my earlier years. I've reviled. I'm, I'm guilty of those. I, I, I deserve to go. I deserve to go to hell. But, now I'm going to start preaching. The good part. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Those of us who believe and love and trust and obey Jesus Christ were washed by His blood. The blood we talked about two weeks ago. We're sanctified. We've been called out. We've been rescued. He, he got down and, and if God were to have hairy hands like I do, he went down to get us on that as we're descending towards the mouth of hell. He went down to get us and his, his fingers singed and he lifted us up because before it was too late, we repented of our sins and we called out upon the name of Jesus Christ. And we're justified. That legal term meaning to prove to be just or to be right. Through the cross of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit blows upon us and blows off that, that smell of burning flesh and burning hair. And the blood of Jesus washes over us, makes us white as snow, and we're presented to the Lord. And we live our way through this world, through this life. And we know we're going to heaven. And you ask, well, maybe hell is just a scare tactic, a, a, an allegory, a, just a, an imagery that the Bible uses. Well, the one thing, if you had to pick one thing in the Bible to prove that hell exists... It's the cross. Why would the cross happen? What Jesus came because he gave us a, a way out. He's a rescue. He's a, the answer. The, the, what do you call it? The life thing um, preserver it's sent to us as we're descending into hell. He didn't go to the cross for his own good. He went for our good because we needed it. We were doomed. And for those of you, I know most of you in here, but for those of you, if, if you were not, if you have not repented of your sins and not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the cross is in fact Christ, uh, uh, it's, like, it's like a beacon saying, come, come before it's too late. Come here for rescue. Come here to be delivered. That's what that cross tells us. So those of us who 
do put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ have no place in hell. Hell has no claim over us. We're not on that slippery ground sliding towards it, grabbing on to muddy sides because of what Christ did on Calvary. Without the blood of Christ, we're those monsters of iniquity. And we deserve hell without Christ. Thanks be to him for delivering us. And then just in closing, what, what are the results of knowing about hell? What are the results of hearing a sermon like this? Doesn't it give you greater appreciation for what Jesus did? For the, the extent of his, the depth of his love for us? To see us and to see hell and to say, I I'm, I'm going to give them a, a way out. I'm going to give them an escape. And the most tragic thing is when people see that and reject it. And they say, I'd rather laugh with the sinners in hell than cry with the saints in heaven. Right? That, that, that's a little bit more of what the song says. But it gives us a greater appreciation for, for, for Christ. And a greater appreciation for the, 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 uh, the love of God. It also commits us more, greater, to evangelism, doesn't it? Because we all know people who we're pretty sure are going to go to hell. Now, we don't judge them that way because time hasn't passed all the way yet. There's always hope. But it should spur our desire to evangelize, to, to bring this hope to people. It should commit us greater, uh, in a greater way to prayer. To pray for those. And I, we're not having a prayer meeting tomorrow, actually, because we're having a church council meeting. But get names to us. If you don't want to come, I, I invite you all to come. But if you don't come, get names to us. And we'll pray these people. And we'll put, create like a, 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 a human chain between those people in hell. And say, if you want to go to hell, you've got to get past us. And sadly, some will. We can't save anybody, but we can make it as hard as possible for them to get to hell. And it should increase our commitment to missions. This church is very good at supporting um, missions in our denomination and Operation Christmas Child and uh, other, other uh, expressions of, of missions, uh, um, Voice of the Martyrs and things like that. Um, it should give us a greater um, burden to support those things if we don't go to support them. And finally, it should give us a greater love for the church because we're the redeemed ones. We've all been on that highway to hell with no hope, as, as John prayed, no hope of anything that we could do to get out of it. But Christ shined that beacon and said, come, this is the way out. Grace and mercy of God is the only thing between humanity and hell. And that grace and mercy is seen at the cross. So today is the day of reckoning. Today is the day of redemption. Jesus is calling you today. I pray that you would just put yourself away, throw yourself away and say, Lord, I pray. I'm yours. I, I, I'm done with this life of living on my own. Um, I give myself to you. Wash me clean with your blood. This may be the day that that happens. So let me pray. And um, uh, you have a lot to think about if you, you know, you're led to think about it. I hope you do. Um, Hell is an um, uncomfortable thing, but it, it, it is, um, uh, it helps us to, to love God more because he rescued us from it. So let's pray.